I'm kind of quite excited because I feel like God's already been speaking to us. We had that lovely song about the wedding bells and entering into our heavenly home. Uh, we talked last, last year, didn't we, about coming home and God is calling us into his presence. Now, Adam and I were in Cambridge yesterday for a lovely wedding. Our Friends, Connie and Andrew, their daughter, Annalie, who we met when she was like two days old, uh, got married. Uh, lovely guy. She's married. Lovely Christian wedding. It was absolutely beautiful. But you know, when you looked at that couple, as they looked into each other's eyes, you could just see the love in their eyes that they would like do anything for each other. They would give up anything. They talked about for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, and you knew that they meant it. And I just felt tonight, God, I just felt God wanted to say how much he loves us. Do you know that he loves you that much? That when he looks at you, when he looks in your eyes, he just, like, he is just, like, bonkers about you. He is just delighted about you. He would do anything for you. You know, he would climb the highest mountain and the deepest valley for you because he loves you. And you know, it's, it's up to us, isn't it, if we respond in the same way to him. I know when uh, Adam and I haven't spent much time together, when we get a little bit of time together and Adam says, oh, I love you, or you look beautiful, there's something like that just kind of wells up in our hearts. And, you know, God wants us to be in that place of intimacy with him where we can receive his love and we can tell him that we love him. And, you know, when we love someone that much, we will go anywhere, won't we? We'll do anything. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll just give up our lives. And I think tonight God just wants us to afresh get that sense of how much he loves us and for us to be able to express our love for him. So hopefully we'll get a bit of time just to pray. I'm not going to speak long tonight, but we have been continuing this series about being a radical community. And tonight we're talking about being on fire. Anybody want to be on fire more for Jesus? I don't, I do. I was, Connie was preaching yesterday and uh, she's this American preacher. I thought, oh, she's still on fire. I, like, I want to be like her. Um, but, you know, God wants us to be on fire, passionate about him. Um, and as a church, we talk about uh, three values. We talk about radical community. We talk about missional movement out. And we talk about passionate spirituality. And that's about being passionate about Jesus with all our hearts. Um, last week, Adam spoke to us about how we're going to honor one another above ourselves, this part of being a radical community of love with our, one another. But tonight, I want to talk about how we can be radical and zealous in our love for Jesus. And how do we stay on fire for him? Because if you've been a Christian quite a long time, I've been a Christian 36 years now. I remember when I first became a Christian, I was 16, and I was so on fire for Jesus. He radically changed my life. I went from being full of spirits at the weekend to being full of the Holy Spirit. My life just changed over the weekend. My friends were like, they thought I joined a cult, actually. They were like, what has happened to her? Um, but like Jesus so like just filled me. I was like, I will do anything for you. I remember one of my college, it was my A-levels, one of my college tutors let slip in one of our lessons that he'd, he'd hurt his back. So I thought, this is my opportunity. So after the lesson, I went, I went knocking on his door. I was like, oh, hello. Um, I think Jesus wants to heal your back, you know, his face. But bless him, he, he let me pray, and I'm not sure if he got healed. But, you know, I was willing to do anything for him. And, you know, God wants us to be like that, full of fire, full of passion, that we would do anything for him because we love him so much. But it's easy, isn't it, to sometimes become um, a bit lukewarm. Actually, Jesus, like churches can become lukewarm. We're talking about being a radical community. We just sort of don't want to be individuals on fire. We want to be a church on fire for Jesus. So like when people talk about reach, we want to say, oh, they're so on fire. That's like a church on fire. I'm not sure if people say that now. I hope maybe they do. But we want to be known as a church that's on fire for Jesus. So Romans chapter 12, we've been following this series on Romans, and I'm just going to preach about this little verse tonight. Uh, it's a little verse, but it's quite powerful. It says, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fire serving the Lord. 
Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fire. And you know, it's easy. Some, some churches can begin to lose their fire. And in Revelation, we hear about a church, the church in Laodicea. And Jesus said this. He said, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Oh, my goodness, that's a warning, isn't it? We don't want to be a lukewarm church. Let's be hot or let's be cold, you know, but let's do one or the other. I'd rather be hot, would you? I'd rather be hot for Jesus and known for that. We don't want to be like that. But if I'm honest, there's also times in my life where I have not been full of the fire of God. I've not been like that. I've been fearful of sharing my faith. I felt a bit spiritually tired, a bit spiritually dull. Um, I remember when we came back from Estonia and Adam was working for the church and I was at home with three small children. Anyone relate to this? You couldn't read the Bible. You couldn't pray. Uh, It's just struggling. I said, oh, Lord, help me in this season. I want to be on fire for you, but I don't feel on fire for you. I don't know how you're feeling at the moment. Maybe you're full of the Holy Spirit. I don't know, someone like, you know, Pete Cripps, he's always on fire, isn't he? And Sandra, she's always on fire. But I don't know how you're feeling today. Maybe a little bit um, tired, maybe. And, you know, sometimes life can just have an impact on us, can't we? The stress at work or the stress at home. Um, and suddenly we find ourselves just being feeling a bit spiritually dry, All these things that go on in our lives can impact our spiritual life unless we have a plan or some strategies for staying on fire. So very quickly tonight, I want to look at three strategies from this verse that might help us stay on fire for God. Is that okay? So hold tight. We will do this. Um, Never be lacking zeal. This little verse actually in Greek I'm not going to do it in the Greek because I'm not as smart as Adam. But I read up in Greek, it reads a bit like this. In zeal, not lazy. In spirit, burning and the Lord serving. If we can remember that. In zeal, not lazy. In spirit, burning, the Lord serving. So the first way to keep your spiritual life on fire is to not be lazy. Um, I don't know, it's, it's easy to think, you know, just some people are naturally zealous, but this phrase suggests it's a choice. We can choose to be lazy. And you know, with me, it can start with the small things. You know, before I go to bed, do I read the Bible or do I see what's on the BBC News app? I don't know, somehow I find it very interesting, the BBC News app. Um, what do we do? Maybe on my Sabbath, I just get very busy with the list of jobs to do. And I don't sit down and spend time with God's presence. It's easy just to get lazy. I was so impressed on Tuesday. There was people coming here. I have to admit, I was like, oh, I'm not sure I want to go. I'd rather just stay at home. But anyway, Adam was going. thought, I'll get in the car. Um, And uh, bless them, there's Glyn and Margaret there and Betty and Mo and others. Not being lazy. They're ready to receive from God. I'm like, oh, Lord, let me be like them. Let's not be lazy. Um, one of our friends, Mo, came around the other night, and Mo is quite in quite good shape. And he said, oh, yeah, I've been going to the gym quite a lot. And I said, what do you do at the gym? He said, oh, I do 600. I was like, 600 what? He said, oh, 600 reps. I do 100 pull-ups, and I do 200 press-ups. I'm like, like how often do you do this? Like, oh, probably every day. I was like, no wonder you're looking good shape. And I do. <laughs> but, you know, if we want to be spiritually in good shape, We need to exercise, don't we? We need to exercise our spiritual muscles. And there are very simple things we can do that will exercise our spiritual muscles. This is not rocket science, and it's not new to us. Spending time with Jesus, reading his word, prayer, meeting with our brothers and sisters, worship, coming together to worship, celebration, hospitality. These are all spiritual exercises which are going to help us be stay spiritually fit. It's the day-to-day things that we can do. And it's funny, you know, when I practice these things, suddenly I'm more on fire for God. It's funny, isn't it? But as we practice these spiritual exercises, and if you're feeling a bit of flagging, maybe just choose one of these and go, I'm going to do that this week. I'm just going to sit and spend some time with Jesus each day, five minutes in his presence. I'm going to see what that does. 
The second part of this verse then is in spirit burning. It's about, the, the, the imagery in this verse is about keeping on the boil. It's not about simmering away. It's about keeping boiling, keeping your spiritual fire boiling, um, not a simmering pot. Now, just after Christmas, I noticed that a very large crack had appeared on my electric cooker. Not blaming anyone. Maybe it was the turkey. Maybe it was the roast potatoes being put a bit hard. But there was this big crack across my cooker. I thought, oh, no, we're going to have to get a new cooker. So praise the Lord, the insurance company said they'd give us a new cooker. And I thought, I'm going to get one of those magic induction hobs. Anyone got an induction hob? Yes, a few people here? No? No? You don't know? It's one of those very, like, heats up very fast. So I was quite excited. So we got this new cooker, and I put my pan on, and very little happened. I'm like, it, like, it started to get a bit warm. I thought, this is taking ages. Well, I read the instructions, and they said, you need to have special pans, and they need a very flat bottom. I was like, oh, I looked at the bottom of my pan, and it was, like, it was pretty wonky. It was a bit like that. <laughs> and what it meant is it wasn't making contact with the cooker, so it wasn't keeping on the boil. And I was preparing, so I thought about that. I thought, actually, we can allow gaps to come so that we're not close to the Holy Spirit. And what that means is we're just, we're just not on the boil. I was thinking, Lord, help us. How do we close that gap so that we are really close to Jesus? How do we close that gap? Because actually, I want to be on the boil. I want to be hot for him. And I was just reflecting, what creates those gaps for me? For me, I think, we, I think it's like Ben was talking about. If we take offense we, at things, we can suddenly feel a bit of a gap between us and Jesus, can't we? A little bit of unforgiveness, a bit of mm, annoyance. Maybe the worries of this world. The Soa talks about that, the worries of the world. Um, can, can create a gap. Comfort and wealth can create a gap. Everything's going quite nicely. I don't really need to be close to Jesus. And also busyness, just being so busy that we just don't spend time in that loving relationship with Jesus. I know if Adam and I are really busy and we haven't had a date night and we haven't really sat down and talked, we can go along quite happily, but there's not that closeness with one another. And that's what Jesus wants. And he wants us to close the gap we can have an honest conversation with Jesus. Just tell him, Jesus, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just feeling a bit of a gap. I'm sorry. I just come back. And, you know, he is there waiting to welcome us into his presence. We can just come and worship him. We can begin to be thankful in our hearts. And that will just close the gap in that relationship with him. So mind the gap. Keep your fire burning. And finally, the final part of this verse, uh, I'll read the verse again because we'll probably all have forgotten this. It, it says, I should know this by now because I'm going to look at um, it. <laughs> it says, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fire serving the Lord. And there's something about, you know, when we're full of the Holy Spirit, that it's meant to bubble over in our lives and in service to him, in loving and serving others. In 1 Peter, it says, each of you should use whatever gift you've got to serve others. It's part of being spiritually zealous, being faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. And, you know, if we're going a bit off the boil, it might be that there actually needs to be an outflow of the Holy Spirit. It's interesting that you think, well, if I'm on fire, I'll serve. But actually, there's something about serving the Lord that actually helps us keep our spiritual fire um, so many people, I was thinking about people in this church, I was thinking, how do you serve the Lord? Sometimes you're not sure, I don't know how to serve the Lord, I haven't had a call. And I think something that has been a principle for me over my life is that I would just try and say yes if God gave me an opportunity. So if somebody asked me, would you do the coffee? I will say yes. Or put out the chairs, I will say yes. Or if Alec Griffiths, as he did when I was 23, asked me to preach on Derby streets. I will say yes, even though I don't want to do it. Um, but like God gives us opportunities to serve. And I, and I know we can't always say yes, but like having that heart that says, yes, I want to serve you, Lord. I will serve you 
even if I'm a bit scared, even if it's difficult, like who you're out on the street sharing his faith in a country where there's spies and all of that, saying yes to God, just saying yes when he asks us to serve. I was thinking of some of the people in our church, actually. Um, I was thinking of Leo saying yes to preaching in English. I don't know if you would preach in Cantonese after you'd been in, you know, China or like Hong Kong for like two years or something or six months. Like, I think that would actually petrify me, but he said yes. Tim Stokes says yes to being at Storehouse every single Thursday. Puya and Ramin and even Kezia said yes to coming on a trip to Iraq when they could have rather gone on holiday somewhere nice. Our kids workers, AV teams, worship team, coffee teams say yes every week. Arafay said yes to running the Iranian group with about know, 30 people in while Paul and Helen were away. Bob and Di say yes to running choices every Friday morning. Janet and others say yes to doing talk it over. Our kids workers say yes every Sunday. And I bet if you asked each of them, let, I just can we give them a clap? Let's give everyone. I haven't mentioned everyone. But all of you keep saying yes to serving. And I bet if you asked any of them, actually, we were out with Ed and Sarah this week and we were talking about the youth work and they were just saying, like, we love it and it keeps us spiritually on fire. It keeps us on fire. They're like the community and serving together. It keeps us pressing into God. So, you know, like the, we need to find some way of outflow, of serving the Lord, of carrying on. Uh, serving him, that we might show our passion and our love for him in service. So three simple things. Don't be lazy. Keep on the boil and serve the Lord. Three simple things. In a moment, I, I want to give us an opportunity to respond because there may be some of that that's stirring something in you. But I really felt, and I, it was just confirmed by the song we sang, that I should just finish with a story and it's a story that Jesus told not long before he died. And it's a story about a wedding. It's a story about the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus tells it like this. He said, the kingdom of heaven, there was 10 young women. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. And they went, they were invited to a wedding. So they went with their lamps and they went to wait for the bridegroom to come. It was an evening wedding. It was quite late. They started to get tired and they fell asleep. Suddenly, at midnight, someone shouted, the bridegroom is coming! Wake up! And they all woke up, and the five foolish women realized that they hadn't bought any extra oil for their lamps. The five wise women, they each had a little extra jar of oil. And the foolish ones said to the wise ones, please give us some of your oil. And the woman said, we're really sorry, but if we give you some of our oil, we won't have enough. Go and, go and buy yourself your own oil. And those foolish women went off to buy the oil. Well, while they were away, the bridegroom arrived and everyone headed into the banquet and the five wise women went in and the door was shut. A little while later, those foolish women came back with their lamps and their oil knocking on the door. And they knocked, and the master opened, and he said, I'm sorry, I don't know you. And they weren't, they didn't enter in. I never knew you. You know, we, Jesus wants us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He's invited us to this beautiful wedding where Jesus is going to be united with his bride. But brothers and sisters, we can't live off other people's oil. We can't live off other people's relationship with God. We can't even live off being part of this wonderful church and worship. We need to have our own oil ready. We need to be ready for the, for the master. We need to be full of the Holy Spirit. And I think some of us here today, we maybe need to get our own oil. Maybe for the first time. Maybe you've never actually asked the Holy Spirit to come and fill you. You need your own oil. It's not your parents' oil or it's not your friend's oil. It's your oil. It's the oil of the Holy Spirit, which represents him and our relationship with him. And also, we can't live off yesterday's oil because it will run out. Some of us are, some of think, oh, I can live off, you know, what I know of Jesus. You know, we'll just go. We can't live off yesterday's oil. 
we need. We need a fresh jar of oil so that we're ready when he comes, serving him, passionate, full of zeal, and ready to meet him. Jesus has invited each of us to this amazing banquet, but he wants us to be ready, full of zeal, full of passion, full of the Holy Spirit, serving him with our whole heart so that when he comes back, because I enter in, my son, my daughter, enter in, my faithful servant, come into my banquet and enjoy all the riches of my heavenly home. Do we want that? Do we want that as individuals? Do we want that as a church, that we would be a church where when we come together, we're full of the Holy Spirit, loving one another, serving one another, full of passion, full of love for him, so that we might enter into what he wants, which is fullness of life. He doesn't want our service just for our service. He wants us to be full of his joy and his life. So should we come and get some more oil? Should we come and get a bit more of the Holy Spirit? Let's just stand and pray. Thank you, Father. I'm just going to pray. Let's have the band come back up when we've got a little bit of time just to respond. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. You've extended that invitation to each of us to come to your wedding. And Lord, we want to be ready. Lord, we love you. Lord, we want to be so excited to see that you that we're ready and waiting and prepared and we're full of the oil of the Holy Spirit. We're shining brightly for you.